Section 7 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 7, Lecture 3. Modern Manufacture and Design. Part 2. This was the substance of my last answer, to which, as I knew beforehand would be the case, I got no reply. But it still remains to be observed that with all the skill and taste, especially involving the architect's great trust, harmony of proportion, which my friend could bring to bear on the materials given him, the result is still only a sporting neckerchief. That is to say, the materials addressed first to recklessness in the shape of a mere blot, then to computativeness in a series of figures, and then to absurdity and ignorance in the shape of an ill-drawn caricature, such materials, however treated, can only work up into what will please reckless, computative, and vulgar persons, that is to say, into a sporting neckerchief. The difference between this piece of ornamentation and Correggio's painting at Parma lies simply and wholly in the additions, somewhat large ones, of truth and of tenderness, in the drawing being lovely as well as symmetrical, and representative of realities as well as agreeably disposed. And truth, tenderness, and inventive application, or disposition, are indeed the roots of ornament, not contrast, nor symmetry. It ought yet farther to be observed that the nobler the materials, the less their symmetry is endurable. In the present case, the sense of fitness and order produced by the repetition of the figures neutralizes in some degree their reckless vulgarity, and is wholly, therefore, beneficent to them. But draw the figures better, and their repetition will become painful. You may harmlessly balance a mere geometrical form and oppose one crotrefoil or cusp by another exactly like it. But put two Apollo Belvederes back to back, and you will not think the symmetry improves them. Whenever the materials of ornament are noble, they must be various. And repetition of parts is either the sign of utterly bad, hopeless, and base work, or of the intended degradation of the parts in which such repetition is allowed, in order to foil others more noble. Such, then, are a few of the great principles, by the enforcement of which you may hope to promote the success of the modern student of design. But remember, none of these principles will be useful at all unless you understand them to be, in one profound and stern sense, useless. Footnote. I shall endeavour for the future to put my self-contradictions in short sentences and direct terms, in order to save sagacious persons the trouble of looking for them. End footnote. That is to say, unless you feel that neither you nor I nor any one can, in the great ultimate sense, teach anybody how to make a good design. If designing could be taught, all the world would learn, as all the world reads or calculates. But designing is not to be spelled, nor summed. My men continually come to me in my drawing class in London, thinking I am to teach them what is instantly to enable them to gain their bread. Please, sir, show us how to design. Make designers of us. And you, I doubt not, partly expect me to tell you tonight how to make designers of your Bradford youths. Alas, I could as soon tell you how to make or manufacture an ear of wheat as to make a good artist of any kind. I can analyze the wheat very learnedly for you, tell you there is starch in it, and carbon, and silex. I can give you starch, and charcoal, and flint. But you are as far from your ear of wheat as you were before. All that can possibly be done for any one who wants ears of wheat is to show them where to find grains of wheat, and how to sow them, and then with patience, in heaven's time, the ears will come, or will perhaps come, ground and weather permitting. So in this matter of making artists, first you must find your artist in the grain, then you must plant him, fence and weed the field about him, and with patience, ground and weather permitting, 
you may get an artist out of him, not otherwise. And what I have to speak to you about to-night is mainly the ground and the weather, it being the first and quite most material question in this matter, whether the ground and weather of Bradford or the ground and weather of England in general suit wheat. And observe in the outset, it is not so much what the present circumstances of England are as what we wish to make them that we have to consider. If you will tell me what you ultimately intend Bradford to be, perhaps I can tell you what Bradford can ultimately produce. But you must have your minds clearly made up, and be distinct in telling me what you do want. At present I don't know what you are aiming at, and possibly on consideration you may feel some doubt whether you know yourselves. As matters stand all over England, as soon as one mill is at work occupying two hundred hands, we try, by means of it, to set another mill at work occupying four hundred. That is all simple and comprehensive enough, but what is it to come to? How many mills do we want? Or do we indeed want no end of mills? Let us entirely understand each other on this point before we go any farther. Last week I drove from Rochdale to Bolton Abbey, quietly, in order to see the country, and certainly it was well worth while. I never went over a more interesting twenty miles than those between Rochdale and Burnley. Naturally, the valley has been one of the most beautiful in the Lancashire hills, one of the far-away solitudes full of old shepherd ways of life. At this time there are not, I speak deliberately and I believe quite literally, there are not, I think, more than a thousand yards of road to be traversed anywhere without passing a furnace or mill. Now is that the kind of thing you want to come to everywhere? Because if it be, and you tell me so distinctly, I think I can make several suggestions tonight, and could make more if you give me time, which would materially advance your object. The extent of our operations at present is more or less limited by the extent of coal and ironstone. But we have not yet learned to make proper use of our clay. Over the greater part of England, south of the manufacturing districts, there are magnificent beds of various kinds of useful clay, and I believe that it would not be difficult to point out modes of employing it which might enable us to turn nearly the whole of the south of England into a brickfield, as we have already turned nearly the whole of the north into a coal pit. I say nearly the whole, because, as you are doubtless aware, there are considerable districts in the south composed of chalk renowned up to the present time for their downs and mutton. But I think by examining carefully into the conceivable uses of chalk, we might discover a quite feasible probability of turning all the chalk districts into a lime kiln, as we turn the clay districts into a brick field. There would then remain nothing but the mountain districts to be dealt with. But, as we have not yet ascertained all the uses of clay and chalk, still less have we ascertained those of stone, and I think by draining the useless inlets of the Cumberland, Welsh, and Scotch lakes, and turning them with their rivers into navigable reservoirs and canals, there would be no difficulty in working the whole of our mountain districts as a gigantic quarry of slate and granite, from which all the rest of the world might be supplied with roofing and building stone. Is this then what you want? You are going straight at it at present, and... I have only to ask under what limitations I am to conceive or describe your final success, or shall there be no limitations? There are none to your powers. Every day puts new machinery at your disposal, and increases with your capital the vastness of your undertakings. The changes in the state of this country are now so rapid that it would be wholly absurd to endeavour to lay down laws of art education for it under its present aspect and circumstances. And therefore I must necessarily ask how much of it do you seriously intend within the next fifty years to be coal-pit, brickfield, or quarry. For the sake of distinctness of conclusion, I will suppose your success absolute, that from shore to shore the whole of the island is to be set as thick with chimneys as the masts stand in the docks of Liverpool, and there shall be no meadows in it no trees, no gardens, only a little corn grown upon the housetops, reaped and threshed by steam. 
that you do not leave even room for roads but travel either over the roofs of your mills on viaducts or under their floors in tunnels that the smoke having rendered the light of the sun unserviceable you work always by the light of your own gas that no acre of english ground shall be without its shaft and its engine and therefore no spot of english ground left on which it shall be possible to stand without a definite and calculable chance of being blown off it at any moment into small pieces under these circumstances if this is to be the future of england no designing or any other development of beautiful art will be possible do not vex your minds nor waste your money with any thought or effort in the matter beautiful art can only be produced by people who have beautiful things about them and leisure to look at them and unless you provide some elements of beauty for your workmen to be surrounded by you will find that no elements of beauty can be invented by them i was struck forcibly by the bearing of this great fact upon our modern efforts at ornamentation in an afternoon walk last week in the suburbs of one of our large manufacturing towns i was thinking of the difference in the effect upon the designer's mind between the scene which i then came upon and the scene which would have presented itself to the eyes of any designer of the middle ages when he left his workshop just outside the town i came upon an old english cottage or mansion i hardly know which to call it set close under the hill and beside the river perhaps built somewhere in the charles's time with mullioned windows and a low arched porch round which in the little triangular garden one can imagine the family as they used to sit in old summer times the ripple of the river heard faintly through the sweet briar hedge and the sheep on the far-off wolds shining in the evening sunlight there uninhabited for many and many a year it had been left in the unregarded havoc of ruin the garden gate still swung loose to its latch the garden blighted utterly into a field of ashes not even a weed taking root there the roof torn into shapeless rents the shutters hanging about the windows in rags of rotten wood before its gate the stream which had gladdened it now soaking slowly by black as ebony and thick with curdling scum the bank above it trodden into unctuous sooty slime far in front of it between it and the old hills the furnaces of the city foaming forth perpetual plague of sulphurous darkness the volumes of their storm clouds coiling low over a waste of grassless fields fenced from each other not by hedges but by slabs of square stone like gravestones riveted together with iron that was your scene for the designer's contemplation in his afternoon walk at rochdale now fancy what was the scene which presented itself in his afternoon walk to a designer of the gothic school of pisa nino pisano or any of his men on each side of a bright river he saw rise a line of brighter palaces arched and pillared and inlaid with deep red porphyry and with serpentine along the quays before their gates were riding troops of knights noble in face and form dazzling in crest and shield horse and man one labyrinth of quaint colour and gleaming light the purple and silver and scarlet fringes flowing over the strong limbs and clashing mail like sea waves over rocks at sunset opening on each side from the river were gardens courts and cloisters long successions of white pillars among wreaths of vine leaping of fountains through buds of pomegranate and orange and still along the garden paths and under and through the crimson of the pomegranate shadows moving slowly groups of the fairest women that italy ever saw fairest because purest and thoughtfulest trained in all high knowledge as in all courteous art in dance in song in sweet wit in lofty learning in loftier courage in loftiest love able alike to cheer to enchant or save the souls of men above all this scenery of perfect human life rose dome and bell tower burning with white alabaster and gold beyond dome and bell tower the slopes of mighty hills hoary with olive far in the north 
above a purple sea of peaks of solemn apennine the clear sharp cloven carrara mountains sent up their steadfast flames of marble summit into amber sky the great sea itself scorching with expanse of light stretching from their feet to the gorgonian isles and over all these ever present near or far seen through the leaves of vine or imagined with all its march of clouds in the arno stream or set with its depth of blue close against the golden hair and burning cheek of lady and knight that untroubled and sacred sky which was to all men in those days of innocent faith indeed the unquestioned abode of spirits as the earth was of men and which opened straight through its gates of cloud and veils of dew into the awfulness of the eternal world a heaven in which every cloud that passed was literally the chariot of an angel and every ray of its evening and morning streamed from the throne of god what think you of that for a school of design i do not bring this contrast before you as a ground of hopelessness in our task neither do i look for any possible renovation of the republic of pisa at bradford in the nineteenth century but i put it before you in order that you may be aware precisely of the kind of difficulty you have to meet and may then consider with yourselves how far you can meet it to men surrounded by the depressing and monotonous circumstances of english manufacturing life depend on it design is simply impossible this is the most distinct of all the experiences i have had in dealing with the modern workman he is intelligent and ingenious in the highest degree subtle in touch and keen in sight but he is generally speaking wholly destitute of designing power and if you want to give him the power you must give him the materials and put him in the circumstances for it design is not the offspring of idle fancy it is the studied result of accumulative observation and delightful habit without observation and experience no design without peace and pleasurableness in occupation no design and all the lecturings and teachings and prizes and principles of art in the world are of no use so long as you don't surround your men with happy influences and beautiful things it is impossible for them to have right ideas about colour unless they see the lovely colours of nature unspoiled impossible for them to supply beautiful incident and action in their ornament unless they see beautiful incident and action in the world about them inform their minds refine their habits and you form and refine their designs but keep them illiterate uncomfortable and in the midst of unbeautiful things and whatever they do will still be spurious vulgar and valueless i repeat that i do not ask you nor wish you to build a new pisa for them we don't want either the life or the decorations of the thirteenth century back again and the circumstances with which you must surround your workmen are those simply of happy modern english life because the designs you have now to ask for from your workmen are such as will make modern english life beautiful all that gorgeousness of the middle ages beautiful as it sounds in description noble as in many respects it was in reality had nevertheless for foundation and for end nothing but the pride of life the pride of the so-called superior classes a pride which supported itself by violence and robbery and led in the end to the destruction both of the arts themselves and the states in which they nourished the great lesson of history is that all the fine arts hitherto having been supported by the selfish power of the noblesse and never having extended their range to the comfort or the relief of the mass of the people the arts i say thus practised and thus matured have only accelerated the ruin of the states they adorned and at the moment when in any kingdom you point to the triumphs of its greatest artists you point also to the determined hour of the kingdom's decline the names of great painters are like passing bells in the name of Velázquez, you hear sounded the fall of spain in the name of titian 
that of Venice, in the name of Leonardo, that of Milan, in the name of Raphael, that of Rome. And there is profound justice in this, for in proportion to the nobleness of the power is the guilt of its use for purposes vain or vile, and hitherto the greater the art, the more surely has it been used, and used solely for the decoration of pride. Footnote. Whether religious or profane pride, chapel or banqueting room is no matter. End footnote. Or the provoking of sensuality. Another course lies open to us. We may abandon the hope, or if you like the words better, we may disdain the temptation of the pomp and grace of Italy in her youth. For us there can be no more the throne of marble, for us no more the vault of gold. But for us there is the loftier and lovelier privilege of bringing the power and charm of art within the reach of the humble and the poor. And as the magnificence of past ages failed by its narrowness and its pride, ours may prevail and continue by its universality and its lowliness. And thus between the picture of too laborious England, which we imagined as future, and the picture of too luxurious Italy, which we remember in the past, there may exist, there will exist, if we do our duty, an intermediate condition, neither oppressed by labor nor wasted in vanity, the condition of a peaceful and thoughtful temperance in aims and acts and arts. We are about to enter upon a period of our world's history in which domestic life, aided by the arts of peace, will slowly but at last entirely supersede public life and the arts of war. For our own England, she will not, I believe, be blasted throughout with furnaces, nor will she be encumbered with palaces. I trust she will keep her green fields, her cottages, and her homes of middle life, but these ought to be, and I trust will be, enriched with a useful, truthful, substantial form of art. We want now no more feasts of the gods, nor martyrdoms of the saints. We have no need of sensuality, no place for superstition, or for costly insolence. Let us have learned and faithful historical painting, touching and thoughtful representations of human nature in dramatic painting poetical and familiar renderings of natural objects and of landscape, and rational, deeply felt realizations of the events which are the subjects of our religious faith. And let these things we want, as far as possible, be scattered abroad and made accessible to all men. So also in manufacture. We require work substantial rather than rich in make, and refined rather than splendid in design. Your stuffs need not be such as would catch the eye of a duchess, but they should be such as may at once serve the need and refine the taste of a cottager. The prevailing error in English dress, especially among the lower orders, is a tendency to flimsiness and gaudiness, arising mainly from the awkward imitation of their superiors. Footnote if their superiors would give them simplicity and economy to imitate, it would, in the issue, be well for themselves, as well as for those whom they guide. The typhoid fever of passion for dress, and all other display which has struck the upper classes of Europe at this time, is one of the most dangerous political elements we have to deal with. Its wickedness I have shown elsewhere. Political Economy of Art, page 62, at sequence. But its wickedness is, in the minds of most persons, a matter of no importance. I wish I had time also to show them its danger. I cannot enter here into political investigation, but this is a certain fact, that the wasteful and vain expenses at present indulged in by the upper classes are hastening the advance of republicanism more than any other element of modern change. No agitators, no clubs, no epidemical errors ever were or will be fatal to social order in any nation. 
nothing but the guilt of the upper classes, wanton, accumulated, reckless, and merciless, ever overthrows them. Of such guilt they have now much to answer for. Let them look to it in time. End of footnote. It should be one of the first objects of all manufacturers to produce stuffs not only beautiful and quaint in design, but also adapted for everyday service, and decorous in humble and secluded life. And you must remember always that your business as manufacturers is to form the market as much as to supply it. If, in short-sighted and reckless eagerness for wealth, you catch at every humour of the populace as it shapes itself into momentary demand, if, in jealous rivalry with neighbouring states or with other producers, you try to attract attention by singularities, novelties, and gaudinesses, to make every design an advertisement and pilfer every idea of a successful neighbour's, that you may insidiously imitate it, or pompously eclipse, no good design will ever be possible to you or perceived by you. You may by accident snatch the market, or by energy command it. You may obtain the confidence of the public, and cause the ruin of opponent houses, or you may with equal justice of fortune be ruined by them. But whatever happens to you, this at least is certain, that the whole of your life will have been spent in corrupting public taste and encouraging public extravagance. Every preference you have won by gaudiness must have been based on the purchaser's vanity. Every demand you have created by novelty has fostered in the consumer a habit of discontent, and when you retire into inactive life, you may, as a subject of consolation for your declining years, reflect that precisely according to the extent of your past operations, your life has been successful in retarding the arts, tarnishing the virtues, and confusing the manners of your country. But, on the other hand, if you resolve from the first that, so far as you can ascertain or discern what is best, you will produce what is best, on an intelligent consideration of the probable tendencies and possible tastes of the people whom you supply, you may literally become more influential for all kinds of good than many lecturers on art or many treatise writers on morality. Considering the materials dealt with and the crude state of art knowledge at the time, I do not know that any more wide or effective influence in public taste was ever exercised than that of the Staffordshire manufacture of pottery under William Wedgwood. And it only rests with the manufacturer in every other business to determine whether he will, in like manner, make his wares educational instruments or mere drugs of the market. You all should be, in a certain sense, authors. You must indeed first catch the public eye, as an author must the public ear. But once gain your audience, or observance, and as it is in the writer's power thenceforward to publish what will educate as it amuses, so it is in yours to publish what will educate as it adorns. Nor is this surely a subject of poor ambition. I hear it said continually that men are too ambitious. Alas, to me, it seems they are never enough ambitious. How many are content to be merely the thriving merchants of a state when they might be its guides, counsellors, and rulers, wielding powers of subtle but gigantic beneficence in restraining its follies while they supplied its wants? Let such duty, such ambition, be once accepted in their fullness, and the best glory of European art and of European manufacture may yet be to come. The paintings of Raphael and of Buonarroti gave force to the falsehoods of superstition, and majesty to the imaginations of sin. But the arts of England may have, for their task, to inform the soul with truth, and touch the heart with compassion. The steel of Toledo and the silk of Genoa did but give strength to oppression and lustre to pride, 
let it be for the furnace and for the loom of england as they have already richly earned still more abundantly to bestow comfort on the indigent civilization on the rude and to dispense through the peaceful homes of nations the grace and the preciousness of simple adornment and useful possession end of section seven recording by todd albrick